Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 0 0.90 Beta. In this episode I hope to start on a lunar sample return mission, in other words landing a probe on the surface of the moon and then bringing it back to Earth. And of course this is a precursor to a crewed mission to the moon with a Kerbal landing on the moon and bringing the Kerbal back. Uh, but uh, it seems like the tech tree has once again sought to thwart me on this. And this is because I, I will need an engine that is deeply throttleable and reignitable uh, in order to make this landing on the moon precise. And I can only think of one engine that would be likely to be in here that uh, fulfills that, and that's of course the lunar descent engine from Apollo. Now, uh, the ascent engine, by the way, uh, did not throttle. Uh, but uh, I don't see it here anywhere. I've got the service propulsion sy system, which is the service module engine. I've got all sorts of other stuff related to Apollo. I've got the service module descent, mo the descent module, the actual fuel container, if you will, the ascent module. I've got that. I've even got the launch escape system. I've got, uh, I can unlock, I believe, the experiments. See, uh, the, these are the experiments that they had on the Apollo mission. So yes, I can even unlock the experiments, but what I can't find is exactly what I need, the descent engine or the ascent engine, by the way. I know I have them in the install because I have FASA's uh, full Apollo package, but I'm just missing those engines and they're nowhere around. So I'm going to have to resort to many one kilonewton thrusters, which are not throttleable, by the way but at least they are uh, reignitable so and of course I'm not using engine igniter I'm just following the rules despite that but yeah we've got we've got engines we just don't have the right engines and so that is my concern anyway there is one thing we can do to make life easier on ourselves and that is to finally unlock fuel ducts fuel fuel ducts we have not been able to actually stage like that at any point and so now I'm going to research that and uh, we will unlock fuel ducts and so we can at least use fewer engines than we otherwise would have had to so otherwise there are uh, some non RP0 things that look interesting but uh, those are really non RP0 in other words using lipid fuel and oxidizer there's the possibility of this M1 series engine, which is very tempting, very advanced, probably too advanced. <laughs> I've got the science, but of course this never actually existed. Actually, it was never used. Possibly they built it, but they didn't use it. Uh, so I don't know how realistic that would be. I would just really like to have the engines that actually were around. Anyway, but... Uh, Let's go with what we've got, and I'll try and build a sample return mission based on that. Okay, I've hit a bit of a snag in building my rocket. I am hitting against a 1,000 ton limit, amazingly enough. And so I'm going to upgrade the launch pad, just for you to know. And I have a... okay, we have to remove the, the launch clamps. But um, yeah, I've also reconsidered the whole M1 thing. I want to try it out to see if I can make the rocket smaller with it. I mean, I'd like to use, you know, uh, technology that has actually been flown, but uh, the rocket is getting pretty big. We're, we're getting to serious levels here. So, yeah, I think I will unlock the M1 series. And hopefully by doing this, I'll also unlock the better variants of the RL-10. That's actually a more important situation. So. I'm going to unlock this and hope that I get an RL-10B2 as well. And I'm going to research that. We also seem to have closed cycle Hydrolox engines. That's interesting. Nuclear propulsion. Uh, still no sign of the, the descent engine, which is really what would save me a lot of trouble here. But anyway, um, well, we've got science. Let me unlock this heavier rocketry as well. Oh, there's a connection here. Sort of looking very heavy rocketry, but I don't know what's in it. I, I doubt that 
the lunar descent engine is going to be qual uh, going to be very heavy rocketry. Oh dear, I've uh, spent a lot of funds now. Okay, well, that arrow spike is tempting too, but we'll hold off here and let me try and build that rocket. Okay, so here's what I've cooked up. It's a new launch system. Uh, I've called it the Shakti rocket. Shakti for power. Uh, again, sticking to Hindu gods and goddesses. And uh, it's basically a, a modification on the Antarixa rocket. Obviously with uh, four sod rocket boosters burning for 90 seconds each. Each of these SRBs has 3,500 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level. And uh, you can see the ISP there, 276 in vacuum, 255 at sea level. And it says 91 seconds here, but 90 seconds there. Uh, but uh, this is barely enough to do a sample return mission. And the other differences between the Shakti and the Antarix rocket is here we have two J2s. So uh, two J2 rockets. And they're J2Ss, so upgraded versions. Oh, and the base engine isn't just an F1, it's an F1A. So upgraded F1, upgraded J2s, and uh, we've doubled those up. So, yep, and we've also doubled up the RL-10s on the third stage. Unfortunately, I still don't get the RL-10B2s. Uh, I still got RL-10A-3-3A. Okay, well, that's the best I can do. That's the best that I can do. I've kept the burn time here to 18 minutes and 45 seconds, which, again, I think is the longest I've seen them burn for. So, yep, that is that. Now, in order to make this work, the J2s have to relight, and they can do that. They had up to three relights. Uh, in order to boost our orbit a little bit higher than the usual low Earth orbit, and then we are going to have to complete our uh, transfer to the moon with the RL-10s, and then after that, the RL-10s will have to get us into orbit around the moon, and then also start our descent. So they have to relight three times once for translunar injection, once for lunar orbit, and another time to finish off in order to get us on our descent. And then and only then do we get to our lander. The lander will of course complete the descent, and it's not the most photogenic thing, and that's because I've had to use one kilonewton thrusters instead of using... Oh, I can up the, the tech level on those. I built the lander before I unlocked the one of the technologies, I suppose. Because I went back to the tech tree to unlock stuff. Okay, so now they're tech level 5, that's good. And I'll up these as well. So here on the lander we have 13 of these silly little 1 kilonewton thrusters instead of having a lunar descent engine of some kind, or ascent engine. I, I'd take the, lun uh, the lunar module ascent uh, engine if I could get it. But anyway, we've got the descent engines and uh, I mean, we don't have the decent engines. We've got the one kilonewton thrusters burning MMH and N204, of course, and uh, these green ones are the descent stage, and they drop off, and then the core is only going to be used on ascent, and then also to transfer everything back to Earth. And this is the avionics core, but then we've unlocked the hex. Uh, it's actually technically, oh, there was there. The Ranger Block 3 core, and the benefit of this is that it allows control of up to 0.5 tons, but I've still had to sneak one of the early controllable cores here to actually get the capacity I need. Um, oh, don't need that. Uh, you can see I'm carrying a goo container, I'm carrying a Geiger counter and thermometer down to the surface, and this portion is the module that goes back to earth and splashes down with these parachutes and this heat shield. Okay, so that is how we're going to return this back to earth. Okay, so that's the idea. We don't have a really long range antenna. We're relying on these to actually, uh, the Commutron 16s and these always open antennas in order to maintain communication. I think we've tested that before. Now, that's not the only issue here. There's a lot more going on. Uh, and I'm trying to remember everything. Uh, we've got a lot of lander legs that is um, a calculated, uh, you know, deficit to our mass capacity, but uh, yep, I'll take that. 
I'll package this up. It is very tight altogether, and even worse, we've got a bad situation as far as our funds because we don't have a contract to do this. We are basically going on the fly here that we've got a contract for Gilly slash Deimos and uh, we've, I've uh, got a position a satellite around Deimos but I don't have a contract to land the probe on the moon. And this is a very expensive launch, 160,000 and uh, we've got 1.17 million we could probably, I mean, that means we can uh, launch this kind of a launch seven times. So that's something. But it's a, it's a significant risk. I'm going to pop on over to the Mission Control to see if we can get some sort of contract for this. Maybe there's a contract there now. And, uh, yep, yeah, but otherwise, we're going to have to uh, bite the bullet on it. I mean, I don't really need science. You can see I've got plenty of science and I really didn't have much to uh, unlock as it is. Uh, anyway, we'll see. Uh, okay, well, build an orbital station around the Mars. Wow. Build an orbital station around the moon. Supporting five Kerbals. That's interesting. That should be something we eventually do. And five Kerbals, maybe our launcher could do that. Maybe our launcher could do that. Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, science data from space around Mars would be interesting. I think that's that, that's something we should do anyway. I I still don't remember where Minmus is. Planet flag on Deimos. Well, after the last one, I don't think we got a risk of Kerbal on that. Bop. Is Bop Phobos? I'll have to check. The rest, Molnia orbit. I guess for funds, we should take these, this Molnia orbit contract. I mean, that's pretty darn easy. Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to pick up this contract in order to uh, get the funds for launches. Whoa, what's this? Highly eccentric tundra orbit. Okay. Yeah, let's take these two contracts for funding. They, uh, I, I don't know why they give us that much funding for these contracts. They must be pretty special satellites or something. And that'll take care of that. So uh, we won't be uh, too bad on funds at least. And then we can conduct our mission. So just on the advance of these contracts we can do this launch. And we could probably uh, use this, I mean, we could probably use a smaller launcher for these two launches. Uh, though um, maybe testing the launcher on these launches would be a good idea. I don't know if this launcher is sufficient to launch a Kerbal to the moon. Maybe on two launches, uh, launching the Kerbal to the moon on one launch and then uh, the having the return vehicle on the second launch. Something like that might be doable. Uh, or um, the lander on one launch and then the equivalent of the command module on another launch. That sort of thing. Anyway, we'll see about that. Uh, the launcher does have very moderate thrust to weight ratio, so that's good. Uh, anyway, we've we've uh, discussed this. I'm tempted to do the new orbital station around the moon. I'll pick it up, but I'll show you my consternation about that uh, in a sec. Yeah. So, uh, what what's the problem with making an orbital station around the moon? Well, five Kerbals, right? So, in theory, we could use the command module plus lunar module to do it. Those cost a lot to unlock, though. As you can see, uh, entry cost of those two combined, we're talking about 630,000 funds. That's that's a huge chunk of our funding. On the other hand, they're not really meant for being a station. And if we look at our station modules, uh, for instance, this hitchhiker storage container is non-RP0. This curb can is non-RP0. This crew cabin is non-RP0. This crew cabin is non-RP0. This crew cabin is not RP0. Um, and so you get the picture that RP0, this heavy orbital habitat, is not RP0. Uh, uh, so yeah, basically you get the picture that RP0 is not very much into stations at all. Now I've vowed not to use the Bonanza cabin, which happens to be RP0 for some reason. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'll have to think about that. I might have to violate the non-RP0 thing in order to make a station. 
I suspect that the reason why this is not RP0 is because of the purchase cost. Uh, it is very cheap. And so maybe that's the reason why I'm getting this. Uh, another possible reason is uh, if uh, people wanted to use these as the as vehicles like the command module or lunar module, they're not really suited to that purpose and shouldn't be used for that purpose. You know, uh, yeah, well, anyway, I'll have to think about that. But, uh, yeah, we've got the contract. We'll do something. Anyway, uh, another point to make. Obviously, I didn't. I unlocked the M1, but I didn't use it. Really, I was looking for the RP, uh, the, the RL10 upgrade, which I didn't get. But yeah, we've got the M1. And I could have built a rocket with it. Uh, it's got the, you know, uh, it's actually got this mode, which is uh, usable right now. 310 ISP on the surface, two, uh, 428 in vacuum, uh, thrust almost that of uh, F1. So uh, really, I, replacing this F1 engine with one of those would have been beneficial in terms of ISP. What would have happened, though, was that the rocket would have to be physically a lot larger because, you know, that burns liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and in that case we need a larger tank because liquid hydrogen it doesn't have the density. And so the whole rocket would have been much bigger. Uh, lighter, but bigger. Uh, as you can see, we are at uh, almost 1,500 tons. That's something else I have to note. Uh, so we unlocked the ability to have rockets larger than 1,000 tons. And we have 1,500, almost 1,500 tons, mainly because of the SRBs. The SRBs have 145.7 tons apiece. So combined, they're almost 600 tons of this mass. The core is less than, uh, well, is, uh, no, a little bit more than 900 tons. Now... In order to control this, of course, we have to have, uh, uh, you know, the avionics and all. Now, I've re uh, these are just dummy structural elements to hold the separation motors. So, just to note there, I don't have any avionics down below. And the reason for that is the only avionics package that I have that can deal with this is not of a form factor that I could have used down below. And that avionics package is this Saturn instrument instrumentation unit. Uh, 3.9 meters as you can see and this is basically where it could fit otherwise if I put it anywhere else in the stack it's not very very easy to fit unfortunately that means I'm carrying two tons with me over to the moon that's not very efficient uh, but if I had uh, put it lower down I would have to have carried other instrumentation units like the uh, Gina avionics package and that wouldn't have been good and taking a look at this you'll notice that this part allows control of vessels up to 1,500 uh, tons, and that's why our rocket is 1,500 tons. And it takes 30 charge per minute. And it's got stability assist, prograde, all, all the good stuff. Uh, the Agena doesn't have all the good stuff. It allows control up, of up to 12 tons, uh, a thousand, no, 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 a hundredth of the, of the Saturn package, but it takes 15 charge per minute. In other words, half of what the Saturn instrument unit does. So it's like, why would I want to put a whole bunch of these when I could put that one? Well, the mass is a thing. But take a look, uh, the mass of the Agena avionics package is 0.28. Uh, in order to control this stage, I would have to put three of them. Because uh, here uh, you can see, actually maybe even four of them, you can see it's 55.3 tons. Uh, this stage plus the payload, so uh, we might we'd probably need four of them uh, because we already have an Agena up top, by the way. Uh, so uh, we need four of them, and that's more than a ton. That's uh, one point one two tons. So the two tons here is not too bad when you think about it, especially since four of them would require sixty charge per minute, double what this requires, and we'd have to carry either more battery or more solar panels in order to manage that. Okay, so that's the logic of carrying the early Saturn instrument unit here. Wish it was spelled right. But anyway, uh, yep, that is that. I think that's all I have to say about the launcher here. But it was a complicated thing to consider, all of these. We have little uh, SRBs to, as Ulrich rockets, 
for the J2s because we have to relight those, so that's what's there. And we've got uh, Alert Rockets in pairs for the RL10s, though that should be on a separate stage. So yeah, hopefully everything's going to be stable on Launchpad. Barely enough to do a sample return mission. Normally, to go to the moon and come back, I, I plan for 20,000 meters per second. Nice round number. Usually works out. And I can break that down for you. It adds up to... Uh, the breakdown adds up to 20,000. So yeah, we're a little bit tight. But now, now we've got some budget. And we've got some satellite contracts to give us more budget. So let's just go and try it out. Okay, here we are. I've lined up the best I can from Cape Canaveral. I could do an off-plane transfer, but uh, I'm just going to go for minimizing the relative inclination and working from there for simplicity's sake, especially since we are so close to our delta V limits. I don't want anything to cause us to have to burn any more than we really have to. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with Planet Shine again. And uh, it's mainly this, I, I thought I could just turn up the vacuum ambient light level and have it be brighter, but that's now not working. Now, it worked before, it's just not working right now. Okay, well, uh, let's just go. Hopefully the rocket will give us enough light. So throttle up, SAS is on. You'll note that the probe has uh, a, the ablative shield short of a layer shielding because we really don't need that much and we needed it lighter. Anyway, uh, that's about it. Here we go. Uh, F1 Ignite. And launch. So here's the first ever launch of the Shakti rocket carrying our currently unnamed lunar sample return mission. I didn't come up with a name for it and maybe I'll think of one on the way. But I'm not entirely confident about it, let me put it that way, because this is the first time we're trying to bring something back from the moon, and you know how much can go wrong like, like that, so... So yeah, not, uh, not sure if I should be naming it just yet. We'll see. So, uh, people commented that uh, for the Deimos mission... Oh, I need to turn, like, right now. This thing has a lot of TWR initially. Um, that I should just uh, use Alt-F12 to complete the contract. I have chosen not to do that. And that's something I'm going to just not do on principle. Uh, just my thing. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to do. I'm just saying it's not something I do. So... So yeah, we'll just proceed as is. I don't foresee any particular problems with science or with funds, so we should be fine. Come on, how about now? Can we, can we get... Oh, there we go. Now it works. Strange. Okay. I guess the rocket has to be launched. Well, as long as it works, it works. So, again, we have a huge thrust weight ratio right now, and so this rocket has to turn very quickly. Could I have had the solid rocket boosters run for longer? Yeah, but actually that hurts the, the Delta V. We want to carry them with us for as little time as possible, really. And obviously having a higher thrust weight ratio was not something I was going to go for, so this was the best compromise. So this is about half the mass of a Saturn V rocket, mainly because of the SRBs. I do expect that it could carry a decent payload over to the moon, though not half the payload of the Saturn V. Again. SRBs not having the same sort of efficiency and we only have one F1 at the bottom. I chose the SRBs because of cost. It could be doable to have a M1 on the center and maybe F1 boosters. That would be a much bigger rocket though. 
Oh, we've got the couplers a little bit overheated. Now, I didn't put any separatrons on the boosters. I'm hoping that they're going to separate cleanly. That's a big risk I'm taking. We'll see. I'm not going to angle it any lower as long as those things are still iffy. Okay, here we go. Booster separation. Ooh, they're not going away as quickly as I'd like. But they did separate cleanly. Okay. Well, now that they're off, let's go to 35 immediately. We'll probably have to hold at 30. We've got two J2s, but that uh, it still takes them six minutes to complete their burn. They need to get us to orbit and then still have about 400 meters per second left in order to give us our initial boost to the moon. So uh, we need about 400 meters per second left in the second stage. Okay, looking good. Time to apoapsis going up. Uh, we're okay on time to apoapsis as long as we're north of a uh, minute and a half by the end of the first stage. I think. <laughs> this is the first time launching this rocket. I probably shouldn't make too many pronouncements about my expectations. So the probe itself does not have much by way... Uh, it doesn't have any solar panels, actually. The return portion doesn't have any solar panels for those the four-day return. It has a battery, so it uh, relies solely on battery power for the return journey. Could have made it lighter without uh, relying on battery power, but actually the, the probe cores themselves had sufficient uh, uh, electric uh, charge capacity. The early controllable core, if you don't use the extra volume for fuel, has, uh, has quite a volume for electric charge. It has a capacity of up to 50,000 electric charge if you use the extra volume for electric charge as well. Okay, first stage is out and set. And J2s. Excellent. Okay. So as mentioned, I need to pitch up a bit probably. Now I had the I had the F1 burning for longer than the F1s generally burn for. I think uh, the maximum burn I know of for an F1 was two minutes and fifty five seconds. I think I had those burning for uh, that that one burning for more than three minutes. Anyway, uh, fairing separation. So that's a choice worth noting. The J2s have uh, burned for eight minutes and twenty seconds maximum, as far as I know. Uh, so six minutes is no problem. Six minutes was standard. With two engines on this stage, it really doesn't need the RCS to prevent the roll. But we have RCS there anyway, just in case. A little bit of MH and N204. And as mentioned, I've got the little separation motors in order to give a boost before a relight. Okay, status report halfway through the burn. Uh, we look to be going a little bit higher than I'd like. Uh, our apoapsis probably aiming for 250 by 250. Um, as far as how much we'll have in reserve, it's looking more like 300 instead of 400 left over. And uh, we'll be lucky if we get that. I'll have to see. I mean, uh, it's, it is looking tight as expected. So, it's gonna be a tough one. I'll have to watch those transfers and make sure I get the best sort of situation I can. Anyway, I'll be back with you close to the end of the burn. Okay, three seconds to apoapsis, though probably much more than that. Uh, we've got uh, 37, 36 seconds left in the stage. We look to be good for making a circular-ish orbit. And around 250, 251.45 kilometers here on the apoapsis. But we are a little bit short on the delta V. Okay, here we go, getting ready for engine shutdown. Of course, we're not using the entire stage. Just a little bit left, though. Okay, so 251 by 238. 
320 meters per second left. Barely enough to make it worth relighting the engine, but uh, there we are. I've extended the Commutron 16s on the payload for communication. It might lose communication along the way, but it should pick it back up on the lunar side with our satellites around the moon. But uh, here I'm going to uh, plot for the moon, so I'll be back with you with what that looks like. Okay, I've decided to go all nice and precise about it, and I've plotted all three expected burns. Uh, the first burn uh, I've set at uh, 320 meters per second, which is basically what I have in this stage depending on how you orient it. And uh, so that'll boost us out a little bit. And then a second burn after we go around, and that'll be with the RL-10 stage, and that's 1,200 meters per second to boost us out to this purple orbit. And then finally a third burn, again with the RL-10, so we'll relay it twice here and then twice over at the moon, one to get into orbit, one to start a descent and that's 1,606. So if you sum it all up, we're talking about uh, about uh, 3,126 meters per second. Okay, so that is our thing, and we've got that burn in 11 minutes. We are approaching daylight, so I'm going to turn down the whole planet shine thing. Okay, so it is more like what it actually should look like, and let's time warp to our burn. Oop, not too close though. It only takes 11 seconds for this part, but that doesn't mean. Huh? I haven't I haven't locked the upper tanks, but I guess we're going to have to. I'll, I'll do it manually. So uh, smarty SS don't do anything. Are these things burning at all? I hope I have them configured right can't really tell. Maybe they're still configured hydrazine. We've got other ports. I should have just... I should have had them right, but uh, maybe I'll check that for our future launches. The upper ports are certainly burning. These ports aren't. Actually, the hydrazine you see there, though, that's for the, the return portion of the probe, by the way. The return portion of the probe uses hydrazine. Okay. Okay. Throttle is up. Don't know why I went to the next maneuver node. Oh, because he passed it. Ah, I'll have to replot them all over again anyway. Darn. <sighs> That was not what I wanted to do. Oh well, so much for plotting them in advance. Okay, separation. Okay, very good. Pyrotechnics worked. Let's see if I've got these solar panels action grouped. Yes, I do. Okay, good. Now we're generating power, enough to supply our cores. And again, the the probe up here, it's going to have to do its business on the surface pretty quickly and then return efficiently, otherwise it's not going to have much battery life. So that's the trick there. On the bright side, it doesn't have too much power draw with its probe cores, but it's still got uh, enough to cause problems. Okay. So, yep, let's, uh, I'll replot and then we'll go around and then two more burns to get to the moon. Okay, here we're stabilizing for burn number one. I can get throttle up right now and all its rockets. And then lighting the RL-10. The two RL-10s now. First time we've we've been using we've been using a, a single RL10 on the third stage all this time. Now we've got two. Okay, let me have Smart ASS get us right on the node. It's just a prograde uh, burn. There's no radial component on this part. 
So basically for the Shakti launcher, we've got a capacity to orbit of, I'd say, 55 tons. Uh, maybe 60 tons. 60 tons. So half of the capacity to orbit of the Saturn V, which is pretty good, uh, considering uh, we've got half the mass, right? It's about, uh, about the same capacity. Uh, we've got the upgraded versions of the J2, we've got the better version of the F1, we've got the F1A, and so all, all around we're, we're doing quite nicely. Actually the RL-10 doesn't matter because uh, the, the payload to orbit is all due to the J2S and the F1A, and of course the SRBs boosting it to much higher thrust to weight ratio. Uh, the thrust to weight ratio of the Saturn V was very low, uh, we had like 1.5, so that is a uh, major factor in why we were able to uh, get to orbit with the same sort of payload, despite using SRBs. While this burn has been uh, going on, I've been looking up to see whether I could get some real SRBs to match the stats of the ones I put on this vehicle. And uh, I think the best candidate, though it's a little bit short on thrust, is the SRB A3s on the Japanese H2B rocket. Uh, at least that seems to be the only one that has uh, a specific impulse equal to or greater than the ones I used there. The vacuum ISP for those SRBs is 283, and uh, the ones I had I think was 275 or 277. Uh, generally, SRBs have more like 268-ish on the vacuum ISP. The burn time for the SRB A3s is uh, 114 seconds, so that's uh, almost two minutes, a uh, minute and 54 seconds, so longer than the burn time of the ones I had on here. Uh, but uh, the thrust is only 2,305 kilonewtons, so that's uh, quite a bit short of what I had on here, but they are used in a group of four. So that's positive. So the other candidates are either underpowered or overpowered. The PSLV-1, which is the first stage of the Indian uh, PSLV vehicle, uh, is way overpowered. It's got uh, 4,860 kilonewtons, and they only use one of it. It's actually the core stage. It's not a radial booster. And its ISP is lower. It's 269. So basically what we have here, except for the fact that the RL-10s should be B-2s, um, what we've got here is basically a modern launcher. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a historical launcher by any stretch of the imagination. The F-1As would probably be F-1Bs now. Uh, J-2Ss would probably be the newer variant to J-2X instead of J-2S. But uh, same basic idea. These are variants of these engines that have not flown. Uh, the F1As and the J2Ss. The, the RL10s have flown. But uh, have been developed. Or are under development. I don't know exactly the status of the F1A or B or the J2S or X. But I know they've, they've uh, lit the J2X, I believe. So... Yep, I think I saw a video of uh, J2X being tested, so so that is a thing. Okay, preparing for engine shutdown here, and off. Okay, a little bit more than I wanted, but fair enough. Okay, so uh, going around again, and then we will make our final burn for for the moon. Okay, here we go. Because we overburned a little bit, uh, this is only uh, 1600.1 meters per second, so that's nice. And uh, yep, I think we're ready to go. We'll probably need the time that we have. So, uh, Ullage rockets once again. Very good. And engine lights. All right. So, uh, off we go again. We've maintained communication so far. It says local control. Oh, yeah! I guess with the Saturn instrumentation unit, this counts as local control. That's sort of weird. I'm going to have to watch out for that. Yeah, I think uh, the Saturn instrumentation unit is considering this local control. I am now AI, apparently. Okay, 
Well, fair enough. So all systems seem nominal. After this burn we'll have 2,400 left in this stage. We need about 800 to get into orbit, so that's 1,600 left. That should work out right. We, I, I think we need 2,600 to get to the ground after that. We should have that, uh, especially upgrade, after upgrading the 1 kilonewton thrusters to tech level 5. I think we can manage this. I don't know if I'm going to fit everything into one episode, but uh, I think we can uh, try it out. I think the mission has a chance, so we continue. It's looking like the throw weight to the moon is just about 28 tons. Though that includes this stage, obviously. We should see what it can uh, throw at the moon not including this stage at some point. That would be interesting. Okay, engine shut down. Gonna take that. Let's see, uh, I'm gonna use RCS to uh, help us out here. Prevent uh, extra lighting of the RL-10s. We've got enough juice, I believe, out the bottom of the stage. Okay, there we go. Well, decided to show me my moon periapsis right on time. So we're going to be on uh, with an inclined orbit, which is fine, since we're going to be landing anyway. We'll pick a spot to land that's close to the equator, and that'll make the return fairly simple. Oh, I forget, we, we have local control, but I, I want to make sure, I, I don't really believe in the local control. The the instrumentation unit, however sophisticated it is, I want to make sure we have real control all the way. And that means checking out our lines. It looks like uh, it looks like it's working out just fine. Even if we lose direct communication, we should be patched through the lunar satellites. Okay, we are in lunar SOI. No, it didn't really want to show me that. Okay, so let's see what orbit is going to take. We're at 64, 65 kilometers now on the periapsis. Still quite alright. And a nice tight orbit is ours for 784 meters per second, which is excellent. Okay, right, well, uh, there's the moon. Let me just verify that we have communication, even though uh, there's Saturn instrumentation-related local control. And, yep, it looks like uh, our communication is good regardless, so that's fair enough. Okay, so uh, final bit of... Well, I guess we can wait a little bit longer before starting the burn. All right, settling the fuel down. As usual, I'll just go for one meter per second, and then I'll light the RL-10s once again. Okay. Alright, getting into orbit around the moon. I wonder if there's a deadline for... I mean... Uh, a limit to how long you can wait before relaying the RL-10s. I think, I think the, I mean, the, some plans call for, you know, uh, using them all the way on Mars, obviously. So I, I don't think it's a problem to wait four days. But I wonder if there's some reliability issue, because obviously they didn't choose to use these on Apollo. I don't. I mean, uh, we have the Apollo service module engine, which is not as efficient, but uh, hypergolic and therefore more reliable. And uh, even now for moon missions, we're not planning to use RL-10s as a relightable service module, so... I don't know. I don't know uh, specifically why we wouldn't use uh, RL-10s as the service module engine for a short moon mission. I assume that the service module engine for Orion will be the same way. 
So basically landing on the moon takes about 2,600, at least that's what I estimate for, and then 2,200 to get back to orbit and then about 1,000 to return home. I'd say 1,200 just to be safe. Um, so you're talking about 6,000 altogether for those phases and we'll have the 6,000 here. We can see 6,600 meters per second left and uh, about uh, 340 meters per second left to burn for this uh, orbital burn. So yeah, I'd planned 6,000 and we've got more than that. So it looks good for the Delta V for this mission. I don't know, I don't have enough time to uh, make the landing in this episode, I don't think. So in the next episode, we'll do the landing and return, and of course the science. Okay, getting ready for engine shutdown once again. And there it is, 67.7 by 62.5 kilometers around the moon. Very tight orbit. And, uh, yep, we've got the fuel, and we've hopefully got everything else all nice and settled. So, taking a look at the orbit, we're looking for a landing spot equatorial on the daylight side. So, let me make sure I'm lined up properly and not messing around myself. So, we're talking about around here. So, once we go over to the other side, we'll plot for some sort of landing in this region. Not too sure what it's called, but, uh, yep. That is the idea, and we'll do that in the next episode. So, a new launcher and a potentially successful lunar sample return mission that will pave the way for landing a Kerbal on the moon. And so I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.